Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this NPTEL MOOCs course on phonetics and phonology a broad overview. So we are continuing with speech perception and as we already know and we have seen in the last few classes perception of speech sounds reflects a category membership rather than continuous acoustic differences. So we learned about acoustic phonetic invariance and how um, there are invariant cues and uh, that helps us to understand speech, human speech. And continuous perception is what you see here in an example there with the stars and then um, categorical perception. So these are various types of stars, these are all the same, but this is a categorical difference between the moon which is uh, not the same as all the stars which are of various sizes, but we are uh, conscious that these two are different categories. So speech perception then uh, starts with something like a uh, confusion. Suppose, so research in speech perception has to deal with all these uh, problems in speech that one may be confused for the other. When we are hearing speech, we are aware of these possibilities. So we can always hear uh, one word to be different from the other and a lot of times uh, we mishear or we do not uh, perceive uh, what was meant to be perceived in the same way. So speech perception starts with confusability and if we take different classes of sounds, for instance if we take vowels, we take stops, we take fricatives, then there is possibility that within that group there may be some confusions. So it unlines, so when that happens, there is always a possibility of substitution, substituting one sound for another sound. So hence, we have to start with the hypothesis that predicts that consonants substitute one for the other. So uh, essentially, this hypothesis predicts that if, if there are consonants, then um, there is always a possibility that they will be substituted, one will be substituted for the other. So let us begin to think about consonants, right? So if we think about consonants within fricatives, so sometimes, uh, so in English it is often the case that uh, the is often heard as the or um, the is often heard as fur. And uh, what we see here in this slide which talks about uh, identification task versus the discrimination task which we had seen before that we asked the listener to hear a sound and decide whether they heard the sound as p or b or we asked the listener to hear two sounds and tell us whether the two sounds are same or different. This is the identification task versus the discrimination task which we are familiar with from our lectures on uh, categorical perception. So however, there could be also uh, some confusability between different categories and assuming that there is perceptual confusability uh, analyze the pattern of substitution of fricatives in English. So this is what we are seeing here with uh, regard to fricatives, these are all the English fricatives. So now what does this chart tell us? This chart tells us of all the times that F was heard as F was heard as the, was heard as the, was heard as the uh, or the, okay? Or all the times v, um, so this is f, this is v, v was heard as f, v was heard as v, and also as the or the or sir, the, etc. Now, what we see here is that this is a figure from Miller and Nicely. And the confusions, the number of confusions of the fricatives and the, and uh, given a set of um, when 
uh, speakers were asked to listen to these words and ask them what they heard. They often heard th as f. So, you can see the number of times th was heard as f. What this chart tells us is that these are the instances of f. How many times were they heard as one of these sounds? So, this is a sort of a confusability map that we have in front of us and this is from a uh, research done by uh, Miller and Nicely, 1955. How do we come to this sort of a speech perception uh, confusability map? There is a procedure for this. So, we have to collect a number of words and then we have to record them and then we have to ask speakers to identify the words. And then when they mistake one for the other, we note down the mistakes and that is how we come to this uh, speech perception map. So, to map the uh, perceptual space that caused the confusion that we see here that uh, v was heard as f, th was heard as f. So, this is the confusion that we are talking about. So, we need to convert these confusions into distances. Now, uh, the mathematician Roger Shepherd had uh, devised a way for doing this. So, how to do this? We calculate similarities and from similarities we derive the distances of one to the other. So, the number of times fa sounds like th is a reflection of the similarity of fa and th in the perceptual space. So, that is the reason as we said before that there is confusion of any manner in a perception is because there is a similarity in the two sounds. And also the number of times th sounds like fa is reflected as fa and th and we will take the proportions rather than the raw count. So, this is the perceptual map of fricatives and this is the matrix which shows uh, if we count the number of times, not the raw times, we take the proportions. So, the uh, value 0.75 that we see here is the proportion of F uh, or the F tokens that were recognized as F. So, out of the 264 times F that the speakers heard, it was out of uh, that 199 times it was heard as F. So, the proportion is 0 0.75. And 0 0.37 here is the proportion of Th tokens that were categorized as F. So, out of the 232 times that th uh, was given to the speakers, some were of actually F. So, that is uh, 0.37. Okay. So, this is how we code the proportions. The P here stands for the proportion and the, here the underscript. So, uh, stands for the row label and the other stands for the column label. So, now this is how we are mapping the perceptual map of fricatives. And now again here what is i and j. So, what you see here as fur, 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 th, one is the letter for the row label and one is the letter for the script. So, basically if we look at this map again, we put the row label fur and the column label ver and that is how we arrive at these two subscripts. The subscript uh, that you see here for 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 the one stands for the row label, one stands for the column label. So they are indexed as i and j. So i stands for the uh, subscript for the row label and one subscript that so subscript that doesn't match and the subscript that match. Okay. So Shepard's method for calculating similarity uh, is from a confusion matrix. So this is how the confusion matrix is is calculated. So, we take the confusions between the two sounds and scale them by the correct responses. So, um, here S i j stands for the similarity between category i and category j that is for and th in table 1. So, we take these values of i and j as we had just talked about the two subscripts and uh, we put them here and then we, we add them and uh, divide by the total correct responses and we get the value. So, to get the perceptual distance from similarity, we take the, so this is another calculation that we have, the two equations. One is where we divide uh, by the correct responses and the other is where we uh, take the 
uh, negative of the natural log and then uh, in maths this is how we find the distance, this is the perceptual distance and this is the similarity and this is the perceptual uh, distance. So this is how we get the similarity, how similar that they are and what is the distance. And to calculate the distance we take the negative of the natural log and this is the formula for the distance. So these calculations are based on Shepard's law and it states that the relationship between perceptual distance and similarity is exponential. So it can be exponential. So as we can see from this is the similarity matrix. So the similarities among uh, American English fricatives based on the confusion matrix from Miller and Nicely. So the perceptual map of English fricatives and the, the the is a stop so it is outside of this map and the location points was determined by the multidimensional scaling of the confusion data. So by scaling the data these values that we have this is what we come up with and uh, now two things here we find clusters and the circle groups are clusters and uh, there was a hierarchical cluster found and one which is outside of this cluster. So, the and fa were closer and the and ver were closer than the. So, something you have to notice here is that how the two voice um, and voiceless groups are patterning separately, are clustering separately. So, the the and fa are very close together so is ver and so are these two sounds ver and the whereas the is patterning with the and the, but the clusters formed are the, the and the, the and the is outside of this cluster. So uh, this is how we have the hierarchical cluster. Then um, look at some other perceptual data that we have. We find a similar analysis where it finally shows that why uh, something is confused for something most of the time because they are very very similar to each other the sounds and we find them when we calculate the distance between the two sounds. So uh, the perceptual map of a place that uh, we have here also have similar findings with regard to the confusion matrix. So let us look at the perceptual uh, distinctiveness of stops. So similar to what you have just seen, we will look at something similar. So and now repeating what we have been saying that perceptual distinctiveness is related to confusability, less distinct sounds are more confusable. One way to measure confusability is, is uh, via an identification task, play a number of consonants. So in this case we are talking about stops and ask the subjects to label the stimuli. So what did you hear? Pa, ta, did you hear up at? So participants will have to write down what they heard and we then we observe the uh, rates of confusion as to what was heard as what. So now the question that we will ask here is that is place confused more often in the post vocalic context. Now this is similar to uh, what you have just seen with regard to fricatives. So suppose uh, here you know, we have the chart here on one side uh, or what you see vertically here is the intended vowels and here we have what was perceived. So were they perceived correctly? You know, so E was perceived correctly most of the time and then there were some confusions. However, if you compare E and E, number of times E was confused for A is much more than the 694 and similarly when we have vowels like ah, so was very often confused for all like 1013 times. So uh, this is what something that you see here, what was intended and then now we um, as we said before we calculate the proportions as to how many times E was perceived as E and how many times E was perceived as A. Now we have the proportions and then we calculate from the proportion after we find that we use uh, our similarity formula here where we divide with the a number of times that something was supposed to be perceived as E or A and then as to what was the actual value they ended up perceiving them as and then we also find out distances similar to what we have just seen. So distances 
uh, confusion matrices are usually not symmetrical. So we do not find that if E is perceived as E more and that it's E will not be perceived as E or E is perceived a lot of times as A, it is not the same thing. So they are not symmetrical. So similarity is related to distance in the psychological space by an exponential decay function and this is a bit more complicated than uh, what we uh, had found that there is this exponential decay function. Now the whole point of doing this extensive lecture to you on multidimensional scaling is not to make you understand these formulas that by given by Shepard, but will help you to understand something that there is a uh, perception is related to confusability. It, these things can be mathematically understood. And then there are various mathematical equations as to how we can derive those similarities and distances between sounds. And although you will, uh, something to remember is that you will not be evaluated for in these distances and similarities. This is just a lecture showing that we can uh, do these things with the help of uh, mathematical equations. And then we uh, come to the end of our presentation today on uh, perceptual confusions with, with some input on um, the vowel space. So with regard to vowel space, there are two uh, nearly orthogonal dimensions that correlate well with uh, F1 and F2. So with vowels, there is additionally the formant values that we have. And um, the dimension that best correlates with F3 is um, not orthogonal, it is close to F2. So F3 as we know is, is uh, not always the most um, important form and taken to, to understand uh, vowels. So, uh, so relations between dimensions of perceptual space and Hertz form and frequencies are again non-linear. So we cannot equate the form and frequencies and what we have from the, uh, the form and frequency values in hertz, how in the perceptual space they are mapping those, uh, those form and values. It is not linear, the, it does not fall in place one on one. The point of making this presentation to you is to show that vowels have complexities which um, also have to be dealt with differently from the consonants. So uh, coming now with the brief presentation on on confusability that is there in perception. Let us now have a brief look at the speech perception theories which are there in the literature and how we uh, understand uh, perception with um, regard to these taking into account the, the various things postulated by these speech perception theories. So theories of speech perception um, must be able to account for certain facts about the acoustic speech signal. And uh, there is interspeaker, intraspeaker variability among signals that convey information about equivalent phonetic events. So uh, the acoustic speech signal is continuous even though it is perceived as and represents a series of discrete units. So that we have seen that in the last few lectures that even though speech is continuous, there is no break between the, uh, the different parts of a speech that we uh, produce, but even then um, we perceive them as discrete units. So that is how speech is like. We do not perceive them as the sounds that make up uh, the words and sentences. We do not perceive them as continuous, we perceive them as discrete. So speech signals uh, contain cues that are transmitted very quickly about 20 to 25 sounds per second and simultaneously and they must also be able to account for various perceptual phenomena. So speech perception theories uh, have to deal with these issues of speech that it is continuous but it is perceived discreetly, that speech is transmitted very quickly, simultaneously and all these things must be accounted for by speech perception theories. And there is uh, categorical perception, there is phonemic restoration and episodic memory plus various word recognition effects. And uh, also there are various ways in which speech perception can be understood. So one is uh, auditory listeners identify acoustic patterns by assigning them to stored acoustic uh, representations. So then we have bottom up 
So, speech is perception is built up from the main information in the acoustic signal, in the physical signal. So, these are questions that speech perception theories will have to deal with. Speech always built up from the signal or is it not bottom up, it is top down? Is it from, it is, is it that we constantly map with our knowledge? And then active versus passive, so cognitive uh, intellectual work is involved in perception or that nothing like that is involved. So, uh, motor properties, so listeners extract information about articulation from the acoustic signal, that is what motor theory says, so that is another aspect that speech perception will have to take into account. And also top down, listeners use high level sources of information to supplement the acoustic signal. And again, is it is it active, that is cognitive work is involved or is it passive? Perception relies on passive responses. So, that it is completely passive, there is no active involvement of our intellectual uh, abilities involved in perception. So, whether it is active or passive, whether it is bottom up or top down, whether it is auditory or motor, these are the different uh, things that speech perception theories will have to take into account while uh, dealing with speech perception or coming up with an idea which um, sort of closely tells us in a certain way that we can understand speech perception uh, the way it happens. Now, if we see all these spe categories of speech perception theories, we will see that most of the things that have been dealt with by speech perception theories are around these ideas, active versus passive, bottom up versus top down, uh, interactive versus autonomous or passive versus active auditory motor. So, these are the things that speech perception theories are uh, dealing with most of the time. So, these are the different theories of speech perception that we have. We have motor theory, we have theory of acoustic invariance, we have uh, direct realism, we have trace theories, we have cohort, we have other like native language magnet or fuzzy logical or logogen. So, there are many theories, we will see a couple of them. So, here we have the cognitive system and then we have all these different things that we have to account for and different theories are accounting the, for the cognitive system in different ways using auditory analysis or visual analysis or grapheme phoneme rules or acoustic phonemic conversion. What are different things which uh, speech perception theories are concerned about. Let us have an overview of uh, these things before we wrap up speech perception and what are the different ways in which speech perception is seen through the lens of these different theories. So, let us uh, recap the things that a speech perception theory will have to deal with. So, there is the segmentation problem 1. There is a segmentation problem which we talked about in all the previous lectures and there is the linearity issue. Okay. Segmentation problem, a specific sound in a word corresponds to a specific phoneme and the ability to break the uh, spoken language signal into the parts that make up words. So, this is the segmentation issue that the signal uh, has, uh, the signal is continuous and but we have the ability to break it up into the constituent parts. The signal, there is no break in the signal, but that the achievement of human perception is that we are able to break it into the component words and component sounds, that is our segmentation problem. And then linearity principle is that the, a, a specific sound in a word corresponds to a specific phoneme. So, this is happening in a linear fashion, we are not jumbling up the sounds and still producing the words. Uh, these things are happening in a linear fashion, we are still uh, able to break down into the discrete parts and this is how uh, perception is happening. Although while we are speaking, it is a continuous uh, stream of sounds. So, these two um, problems, issues, principles like the segmentation problem or the linearity principle suggest that speech perception is based on a linear correspondence between the acoustic signal and the phonemic units. So, this is happening continuously and in a linear fashion one by one we are breaking up the words and the sounds and making sense of what is being spoken. So, although we perceive speech as a series of uh, separate and distinct phonemes and words, the acoustic boundaries between phonemes is blurred. And although uh, we are uh, perceiving 
the, the speech as a series of separate distinct phonemes and words uh, the acoustic boundaries between phonemes is blurred and this is what we uh, keep on saying that a speech signal has very minimal information but then the speech perception ability is that despite the minimum information despite all the variation that is possible in the acoustic signal a listener is able to perceive and discreetly break up the sounds component sounds of a a word and a sentence and linear in a linear fashion map one to the other even though the acoustic uh, signal is um, rife with all sorts of variation is rife with all sorts of um, of information which may not be always invariant we uh, heard that in the previous lecture that not always uh, invariant the for instance the form and transitions as we can see here the subject to change right so the speech signal is also continuous so how are listeners able to recognize speech sounds and words despite wide variations in speaker production so speaker variations and gender differences age differences etc are the things which contribute to the variation in the uh, speech signal so normalization is the ability to perceive words spoken by different speakers at different rates and in different phonetic contexts as the same and then some other things that speech perception theories will have to take into account first thing is the what is the basic unit of a speech perception so is it acoustic phonemic features is it allophones phonemes syllables words what is the basic unit of speech perception and then listening in noise so we are listening and we are perceiving speech in a lot of noise so there may be other people speaking there may be noise industrial noise there may be noise from vehicles there may be noise from nature environment etc yet yet we still perceive so uh, and then there can be very general noise coming from uh, virtually um, you know almost nothing at all just distance etc so there is always there is always the possibility of noise in speech and yet we are able to perceive so that noise element will have to be accounted for by speech perception and then how do children start perceiving when they are trying to um, respond to what they have listened to so it is seen that they focus on uh, syllables and form and transitions and then uh, specialization of speech perception in speech perception is specialized function in humans humans are able uh, to do uh, what we know now as mm, categorical perception and we know that not just humans uh, we have seen that in the previous lecture even animals are capable of categorical perception uh, however the perceptual magnet effect we will study what is the perceptual magnet effect is not very prominent in animals so poorly discriminated from typical vowel prototypes so this is a, a diagram showing um, the responses to perceptual magnets by of prototypes by american infants and swedish infants and then we can see that uh, they they respond poorly to perceptual magnets again um, we have quinted ourselves with active versus passive uh, theories a bit before and and we know that active theory suggests that speech perception and production are closely related and listener knowledge of how sounds are produced facilitates recognition of sounds and passive theories emphasizes the sensory aspects of speech perception and listeners utilize internal filtering mechanisms and knowledge of vocal tract characteristics play a minor role for example when listening in noise conditions so active versus passive theories we have acquainted ourselves with that and then uh, in one um, suggest that speech perception and production are closely related in the other it uh, emphasizes the sensory aspect so of a uh, speech it uh, knowledge plays a, a lesser role the role of sensory aspects of speech is highlighted in passive theories so active theories put a greater emphasis on our intelligence human intelligence in perception and so again bottom up top down we have seen this before and top down processing works with a knowledge of uh, a listener has about language context etc and bottom up processing works in the absence of a knowledge base providing 
top-down information. So listeners receive auditory information, convert it into a neural signal and process the phonetic feature for information. And then we have the autonomous versus the interactive theories. Uh, so we will not uh, talk about uh, autonomous versus interactive so much uh, as in the difference between feed forward processing and um, uh, because we are not talking so much about processing but it is good to know that such theories are also there. So these are the different speech perception theories as we have just mentioned. We have motor theory, acoustic invariance theory, we have direct realism, trace model, we have logogen, we have cohort, fuzzy logic model of perception, native language magnet theory. So what is uh, motor theory? Uh, motor theory, uh, given the lack of acoustic invariance, we can look for invariance in the articulatory domain. And motor theory postulates that speech is perceived by reference to how it is produced and that is when per perceiving speech, listeners access their own knowledge of how phonemes are articulated. And uh, motor theory um, shows that articulatory gestures such as rounding or fronting, etc., are these are the actual units of perception, that is what motor theory tells us, and they directly provide the listener with phonetic information. So, the biological specialization for phonetic gestures uh, prevents listeners from hearing the signal as ordinary sound, but enables them to use that for systematic special relation between signal and sound to perceive the gestures. So um, the articulatory gestures uh, are the real perceptual units. So and then there is a uh, biological specialization for phonetic gestures which prevents listeners from hearing the signal as ordinary sound. So we hear a uh, speech signal as linguistic and we always map it to uh, something uh, that is um, linguistic and has to be perceived in a certain way because it is the articulatory gestures are encoded in our perceptual abilities in such a way that they are the units of perception. So there is a special relation between signal and sound to perceive the gestures. And uh, motor theory commands that control articulation were considered to be the invariant phonetic features. And the revised theory sh says that the that is in, it is intended gestures that are the invariant object of perception. But regardless, we have to remember that the gestures, the articulatory gestures are the object of perception. The gestures are the units of perception. So that is what motor theory tells us. And um, these are the various stages involved in motor theory. There is an uh, internal representation and there is a processing which is involved there and then this is the received message. So um, we have you know, various uh, things in the articulation, the articulatory patterns, articulatory hypothesis and then these, these are extracted for articulatory movements and then there is a generation of um, uh, hypothesis of the sounds based on the neuromuscular knowledge. This is the active processing which is a um, model and then the reconnection, the connection of the perceived units into larger units of symbol of syllables and words etc. happen in the motor theory. This is the postulation of speech. This is the postulation of motor theory with regard to speech perception. Uh, so we perceive according to motor theory, we, speech, uh, we perceive speech discreetly, categorically because sounds are produced with discrete articulators and gestures. In this model, speech perception is based on auditory matching mediated through speech production. When a listener hears a speech signal, he or she analyzes it by mentally modeling the sound. If the auditory result of the, of the mental synthesis matches the incoming acoustic signal, the hypothesized perception is interpreted as correct. So analysis by synthesis is therefore different from motor theory. In this model, the auditory matching is true um, speech production. So this is one of the auditory um, audition theories where the auditory part is important. So when the listener hears a speech signal, he or she analyzes it by mentally modeling the sound. So when you hear something, you model it. And in, if the auditory result of the mental sim synthesis matches the incoming acoustic signal, the perception is interpreted as correct. So a lot of emphasis is put on the auditory part of speech perception here. 
And then we have the direct realist theory. So direct realism postulates that speech perception is direct. That is happens through the perception of articulatory gestures, but it is not special. All perception involves direct recovery of the distal source of the event being perceived. And in vision, you perceive objects. Likewise, with smell, you perceive food, flowers, etc. And same in the auditory perception of speech. So in the direct realism theory, um, speech perception is, is direct. What does it mean? It happens through perception of articulatory gestures. But the gestures are not special because there is no intervening uh, process there. So it is a sensory perception. So like food, flowers, if you get the smell, you perceive that is food. You get the smell, you perceive that is flowers. And the same thing is with auditory perception of speech. So listeners perceive tongues and lips. And the articulatory gestures that are the objects of speech perception are not uh, intended gestures. So unlike motor theory, uh, here in direct realism theory, the articulatory gestures are where the articulatory gestures are objects of perception. Here it is not so. Here it is not about the gestures, it is about tongue, lip, um, etc., the different parts of our vocal um, uh, abilities to produce sound. Those are perceived and that is how we perceive sounds. Rather, they are the actual gestures. So, and that is how uh, uh, direct realism is uh, understood. So, a trace model, it is a connectionist network model of speech perception, lexical perception, and different levels of speech units are represented on different levels of the network. So, it's, it influences across levels and shares excitatory activation, that is, activated features lead to the activ activation of the related phoneme, and activated phonemes activate units on the word level. And influences within a level, those that are cons inconsistent with each other are inhibitory. That is the activation of one phoneme level unit inhibits the activation of other competing phonemes. And trace model assumes there is a cognitive unit for each feature, each feature, for example, nasality at the feature level, for each phoneme at the uh, phoneme level, and for each word at the word level. At any given time, all of these units are activated to a greater or lesser extent as opposed to all or none. When units are activated above a certain threshold, they may influence other units at the same time. And these uh, effects may be either excitatory or inhibitory. And the entire network of units is referred to as trace because the pattern of activation that is left by a spoken unit is the trace of the analysis of the input at each of the three processing levels. So there are three processing levels, but uh, the spoken input is the trace. It leaves the trace in the three levels, and that is why it is called the trace model. So the cognitive unit for uh, is the feature, and at the feature level for each phoneme at the phoneme level, and uh, for each word at the uh, at the word level. So this cognitive unit and um, the entire the, the network of units that we have in trace model, um, so they uh, it's a trace basically, and that's why the cognitive unit is a trace, and that's why it is called a trace model. So, for example, a listener hears the beginning of uh, a word ball, and the ball and the words ball, the ball, bad, pill become active in memory. Then soon after, only ball and ball remain in competition, and bad and bill have been eliminated, eliminated because the vowel sound doesn't match the input. Soon after, ball is recognized, and therefore trace simulates this process by representing the temporal. Uh, dimension of speech allowing words in the lexicon to vary in activation strength and by having words compete during the processing. So the, there is activation happening at each level and whatever is activated is basically um, understood as one of the words which might be the, uh, the, the resultant output of the system because of the activation strength the possibility of each word resulting as the output or resulting as the word which will be perceived will be different. So therefore, trace model is a neural net model and it aims to uh, identify or and activate words and it accounts for 
categorical perception and Ganong effect and other traditional phonetic findings that were considered important in the 1970s. So, it is a connectionist model of speech perception. Unlike um, direct realism, so we have already looked at uh, direct uh, realism. So, we will uh, look at uh, cohort theory a bit. Now, a cohort theory models spoken word recognition. It is based on the beginning of an input word and all words in memory with the same word initial acoustic information that is the cohort are activated. So, there is a cohort which is activated and as the signal unfolds, members of a cohort which are no longer consistent with the input are eliminated. So, cohort elimination continues until a single word remains and the point at which a word diverges from all other members of the cohort is called the uniqueness point. And cohort theory is designed, is, was designed specifically to account for auditory word recognition and the model posits that when a word is heard, all words beginning with the first sound of target words are activated. And this uh, set of words is considered the cohort. Once uh, first cohort has been activated, other information or sounds in the word narrow down are, the, the choices are narrowed down. So, listener recognizes word uh, left with a single choice that is called the uh, recognition point. So, this is uh, a cohort uh, theory. So, in, in stage 1, suppose this, this was the word stack. So, all these words uh, will be activated. So, similar to stack static, stack, stab, stagger, stamina, stampede and then there might be um, elimination of some words because they are uh, different. So, stab and stack are pretty close and stamina is now uh, excluded because it is uh, very far from uh, stack and then stampede and all these are uh, better matches to stack and all these activities and finally, they are all eliminated uh, to the effect that the, the one which is perceived is remaining and that is the elimination point. Uh, similar also to cohort and in similar models where uh, different words are activated is the neighborhood activation model and the neighborhood activation models spoken word recognition as the identification of a target from among a set of activated candidates. So, these are the competitors. And all words phonologically similar to a given word are in the word's neighborhood and recognition of a word is based on the probability that the stimulus word was presented compared to the probability that other words in the neighborhood were in fact also presented. So, probability is also influenced by lexical frequency and uh, that is the neighborhood activation model and then there are, there are other exemplar models like um, non-analytic approaches. In, in most of these models speech perception uh, of speech perception, the objects of perception are highly abstract and in fact, information about specific instances of a particular, particular word are abstracted away from and discarded in the process of speech per perception. So, information about a particular speaker or speech style or environmental context can play no role in the representation of uh, words in memory. So, uh, information about particular speaker or speech style does not play a role according to exemplar models and it is a very highly abstract sort of a model where uh, information of the specific instances are abstracted away and discarded in the process of speech perception and only the abstract information remains. So, that is why it is called an exemplar model. And exemplar models postulate that information about particular instances, uh, the, the episodic information is stored and these are mental representations that uh, do not have to be highly abstract, but they do not necessarily lack redundancy. And the, the categorization of an input is accomplished by comparison of all remembered instances of each category and often exemplars are modeled as categorizations of words, but they might also be categorizations of segments or syllables. Stored exemplars are activated according to the degree of similarity and activation levels determine categorization. So, and then we have acoustic invariance theory where listeners inspect the incoming signal for the so-called acoustic landmarks, which are particular events in the spectrum carrying information about gestures which produced them. 
and gestures are limited by the capacities of human articulators and listeners are sensitive to their auditory correlates. The lack of invariance simply does not exist in the model and the acoustic properties of the landmarks constitute the basis for establishing the distinctive features. And very importantly, the acoustic properties are the most uh, important here, the acoustic invariance theory and there is no lack of um, invariance in this model and um, bundles of distinctive features uniquely specify phonetic segments. So, the, the incoming acoustic signal has um, acoustic landmarks which the listener is listening to and that is what the acoustic invariance theory tells us. The pr two principal claims of the acoustic invariance theory is that they are invariant acoustic uh, patterns in the speech signal which correspond to phonetic features and that humans perceive these properties, these acoustic invariant acoustic patterns are perceived by humans to provide the phonetic framework for natural language and to process the sounds of speech in ongoing perception. Finally, we have the native language magnet theory and according to Kuhl's uh, native uh, language magnet theory, the phonetic perceptual space is organized in terms of prototypes. Prototypes are defined as mental representations or perceptual maps of the speech and prototypes function as perceptual magnets and exert an ex attracting force on neighboring auditory representations. Thus, the perceptual space appears to be warped in the neighborhood of a prototype because a prototype attracts exemplars. Remember the exemplar theory where we have different exemplars, uh, abstract features um, that fall within its uh, region of influence. So, the uh, perceptual, the phonetic perceptual space is organized according to prototypes. Prototypes is extremely important in native language magnet theory and prototypes are defined as mental representations of or perceptual maps of the speech. So, what are prototypes? These are mental uh, representations or, uh, or perceptual maps. So, and that is how uh, we create um, prototypes of our native languages. Data shows that infants perceptually map critical aspects of ambient language in the first year of life before they can speak. And statistical properties of speech are picked up through exposure to the ambient language, language in the child is growing up. And then linguistic experience alters infants perception of speech, warping perception in the service of language. And infants are neither the tabula rasa of Skinner described nor uh, innate grammarians of, of Chomsky, but they create these perceptual maps. Infants have inherent perceptual biases that segment phonetic units without providing innate, innate descriptions of them. So, infants use inherent learning strategies that were not expected once um, and they are thought to be too complex and difficult for infants to use. Adults addressing infants can unconsciously modify speech. So, in infant directed speech, in child directed speech, those uh, there is a lot of unconscious modification in ways that assist the brain to map the language. So, the way child directed speech is spoken is it in such a way that helps the child to map the language. In combination, these factors provide a powerful discovery procedure for language. So, we come to the end of our lecture on speech perception. In, in these lectures, we tried to only give you a broad overview of speech perception. We were not able to go into the, into the details of, for instance, um, MDS or uh, perceptual uh, confusability, uh, multidimensional of uh, an analysis to the help of multidimensional multi scaling because this course is gives you a very broad overview of these aspects and and they have to be so if you are interested then you are very welcome to follow uh, whatever uh, was 
um, discussed very briefly here. You can consult the book by Keith Johnson, which is there in our list of readings, etc. You can follow those and look into uh, how those things can be actually implemented, even though we did not go into uh, a lot of detail of uh, multidimensional scaling, there is always the, uh, all those things to follow up if you are interested in greater detail. This course, this lecture especially was give, giving you a very broad idea about the issues in speech perception and uh, the ways of analyzing problems in speech perception. And also in this lecture, we gave you a very broad overview of different types of theories of speech perception available like motor theory, like direct realism, trace theory, native ma magnet theory or exemplar models, etc. Telling you how different speech perception theories try to um, accommodate all these complexities which are there that, that speech is continuous uh, yet it is perceived in discrete ways and how they try to understand or analyze or give us an idea of what must be happening in um, our uh, perceptual spaces and how we must be uh, achieving the task of perceiving speech all the time that is um, a speech. So, and um, th therefore this lecture was also a very broad overview of the problems in speech perception and the different theories which are there. And um, again, this is an overview. This was not a very specialized lecture on either of these two issues. And you're very welcome to follow up if you're interested in this area. And thank you for listening. We will uh, continue with phonology from the next module. And this brings us to the end of um, articulated phonetic, acoustic phonetics and perception. And we will again continue uh, with where we left off with phonemes in the, uh, in the first lecture. We will start again with phonemes and the history of phonology, etc. from the next module. Thank you very much for your attention. <music>